Okay, good morning. Uh, today's presentation is ILM 310304E Physical Property Analyzers. Uh, quite a whirlwind of information in this ILM. Um, let's look at the objectives for today. Today we will describe the principles of analysis and application of distillation analyzers, which work on the physical property of boiling points. Uh, we'll describe the principles of analysis and application of vapor pressure analyzers, which is the second physical property. Uh, principles of analysis and application of viscosity analyzers, which is the third physical property. And principles of analysis and application of density analyzers. So four physical properties uh, and their associated analyzers are the topics of the day. So boiling point, vapor pressure, viscosity, and density. This module is going to introduce you to physical property analyzers. We start out, uh, actually the whole ILM basically is designed uh, in a way in which we compare online analyzers to laboratory methods uh, and learn about their op operation, application, and maintenance. So we'll start out, um, we'll start out with each of the four uh, physical properties that we're discussing. Uh, we'll look at the laboratory methods for uh, analyzing these physical properties uh, and then end up with uh, talking about the online continuous analyzer version of the laboratory procedures. Uh, first one we're going to talk about is distillation, um, which of course is one of these, one of the uh, major uh, industrial processes in Alberta. Uh, largely relying on boiling point uh, in order to separate different fractions of uh, hydrocarbons you know, that we use for fuels and oils and things like that. Um, but we will also look at vapor pressure, viscosity, and density uh, as we move forward. So we said earlier we're going to compare these things to standard lab uh, procedures and then kind of evolve into the online analyzers that uh, fall into play in our uh, wheelhouse uh, as tradespeople. Uh, so some background information here. Uh, all laboratory methods on how process analysis is to be carried out is governed by some kind of standards. <clears throat> the standards that we deal with in this ILM are the ASTM standards uh, for boiling, vapor pressure, pour point, and density, and they relate to the four physical properties that we're going to be talking about. We do have to understand that laboratory and online analyzers are different, and the major distinguishing factor between the two of them is that laboratory analysis is typically a batch uh, batch style analysis done on a grab sample uh, and results are derived from that particular sample versus uh, online continuous analyzers that are connected to the process and are always taking uh, measurements and doing uh, analysis. So uh, there is significant kind of differences technologically and, and uh, in terms of accuracy and things like that when we compare lab standards to uh, online analyzers and there's no real comparison like you can't say that they're exactly the same um, but they are relatively uh, similar enough and we can take our field measurements from online analyzers and compare them to lab standards through a process which is called uh, correlation. Correlation basically means is that we take our laboratory uh, methods and results on one axis and our analyzer online analyzer uh, points on another axis and we if we were to overlay them uh, we would see that they're not exactly right but it, we can in, in essence uh, what we're doing is characterizing um, the results that we get and, and we're saying okay well if the online uh, analyzer is uh, this number the actual number according to the laboratory is going to be this number so um, it's kind of a relative uh, relative comparison. So that's the first thing that we need to kind of understand. Um, once we once you're up and running and you have your analyzer uh, online and everything like that, you usually will just run with the operating values of that analyzer with an understanding of, of what that is uh, representative in comparison to uh, what you would have if you took that same sample to a lab. So for example, you would know that uh, if you're uh, analyzer is saying it's uh, 
you know, 400 ppms or something like that, but you know that if you took that same sample to the lab, it would only be 390. It's not a big deal as long as you understand that, and that's done through kind of this correlation process. So jumping right in now uh, into laboratory method uh, D86. Uh, this is, we talk about distillation first uh, as, um, as a physical property. So the first section here is on distillation, and we'll talk about a few different laboratory processes for distillation. Uh, so we get a, a good theoretical background of of kind of of kind of how it works. Now, distillation as a subject is a lot larger than we can, of course, cover in uh, a few hours or even a few weeks. But this does give you a real good idea uh, of the origin of the analysis and the technology that we are using today. So first one we're looking at here is the laboratory method D86. Uh, this is an ASTM standard for atmospheric distillation, meaning just uh, distillation that's done at atmospheric pressure. Uh, here we have a standard distillation apparatus. Um, you will put in this flask uh, a pre-measured specified amount of fluid uh, according to the standard. And in, in this case, the standard requires 100 milliliters of liquid. Uh, it's on a heater. And uh, without making this a long drawn out process here, uh, the, the basic steps of this type of analysis is we take the 100 milliliter sample, we heat it up uh, to some certain set temperature. And now this temperature will uh, change depending on the products that we're hoping to hoping to distill. And in order to get a baseline for what that temperature is, there are all kinds of charts and tables uh, that will tell you what certain products will boil off at. And that is something you kind of need to know in order to do this properly. But long story short, we take a sample, we heat it up. Um, we heat it up a little bit, starting out with low heat, uh, hoping to get to a heat at, at a point which vapor will start to form. Uh, once that vapor starts to form, uh, we'll take the temperature through this thermometer here, and we can then identify that point where the, the vapor starts to form as the, as the boiling point. That vapor rises in this column, goes through this uh, condensing tube, which is chilled, and it can be in an ice bath or a, a flow loop of chilled water or whatever it is. The vapors condense, and then the volume that condenses from those vapors is recorded. We can take that volume at a given temperature and we can say that this sample is X, X percent of, let's say, for argument's sake, uh, gasoline. And we'll say that this, we had 100 milliliters and we, we set it to 75 degrees Celsius and we let it vaporize at 75 degrees Celsius. And at some point in time, we're going to, we're going to run out of the lighter uh, constituents in our sample and there's going to be heavier stuff left behind. So you essentially you boil off all the light stuff first at a certain temperature, measure how much of it boiled off, increase the temperature a few degrees, that will make something else in here start to boil off. You'll measure the amount of that product that boils off, it becomes a percentage of the whole, and you keep increasing the heat until you uh, run out of sample or you start to burn your, uh, burn your sample. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, at every given temperature, um, you will take off a certain percentage of that sample, and then you can say that the sample is X percent this or X percent that. So D86, anyway, atmospheric uh, method. And the theory moving forward is pretty similar. So the things that we discover uh, doing one of these tests uh, can be charted on a, a graph like this, which is uh, representative of the uh, temperature that we're heating it at and the volume that is recovered from that particular sample. And from this graph, you'll see there's some uh, points on here that are important for us to know. Uh, IBP here, which stands for initial boiling point. So this is the temperature. Uh, we start out at a low temperature when we raise it, raise it up um, until we start to get vapor. That vapor then will condense. Once it condenses uh, and we get a drop out of the end of the apparatus, we call that temperature the initial boiling point temperature. We'll then uh, leave it at that temperature until it stops uh, condensing. Then we'll increase the temperature a little bit more, wait for it to go through its process and stop condensing as we continue to keep increasing the temperature in steps. At some point in time, we're going to uh, run out a sample. 
uh, and that last time, last drop that comes out of our sample is called the final boiling point, and we can have several intermediate boiling points uh, in between here, which all kind of represent different uh, cuts or fractions uh, of our of our sample. Um, boiling range uh, in this particular graph here you see shows somewhere roughly between around 170 or 180 and about 250 degrees or something like that. If we know the boiling uh, points of certain uh, liquids, we can identify those liquids based on their temperature. Um, for example, in this particular sample here, we have 90% of our sample has been recovered after we boiled it off at a temperature of about 283 or 238 degrees. And if we had a table, um, we can identify uh, kerosene, this is a curve for kerosene, by knowing that 90% of that sample will condense at that temperature and, and it's tough it's just like saying we know that if we had a sample that was 100 percent water uh, and we set it to 90 degrees celsius and and heated it up no vapor would form uh if we hit it to 95 no vapor would form but as soon as we got to 100 degrees celsius we'd start to get vapor because that's the boiling point for water that vapor would condense and after a number of a uh, number of minutes uh all of that water would be gone. Uh, so we know that if everything disappeared at 100 degrees Celsius, well then it must be a liquid whose physical property lets it vaporize at 100 degrees Celsius and water would fit that bill. So there's tables that will tell you the approximate ranges uh, for different products and their, and their temperature ranges. The second method we're going to look at here, uh, and again uh, moving forward looking at these methods here, um, you kind of do have to have a basic idea of the ASTM numbers here. There's not a ton of them to worry about, um, but do understand that they're relatively similar save for the numbers here. So D1160, for example, is essentially the same procedure as a previous example, except we're done, we're doing this under a vacuum. Uh, the main reason we do this under a vacuum is when we have a process that's under a vacuum, it allows us to boil that fluid at a lower temperature. Um, this is used on heavier samples that would get destroyed at the higher uh, atmospheric boiling point temperatures. Uh, the, the vacuum then uh, lets them boil at a lower temperature so that we don't destroy them. So I don't say anything much more about that. If you understand the operation of the D60 uh, or D86 method here, the 1160 is the same, it's just under vacuum. <clears throat> so we look at, uh, so that's the theory uh, behind it, the laboratory type theory. Uh, now we're going to kind of look at uh, three different analyzer types. They are uh, final boiling point, initial boiling point, and vacuum. So these are familiar terms that we've addressed already. So I'll give a pretty uh, elaborate kind of write-up in the presentation here um, on the first one. And then the second and third ones are essentially the same, only the uh, apparatus and some procedural details are, are uh, the apparatus is generally the same, but there are some procedural details that are different. It was difficult for me to uh, kind of summarize what goes on in these analyzers in a, in a couple of points here. So um, you, you will get a better understanding as you read through the ILM, uh, but this is kind of hitting on the high points of the operation of, of uh, in this case, a final boiling point or end point analyzer. Okay, so these analyzers operate continuously uh, based on a recovery rate rate of 50% or greater of the sample. So this is one of the specs that you're gonna uh, wanna compare uh, between this one uh, and the next one that we look at. Uh, this is a final boiling point. We're gonna look at the initial boiling point next. Uh, and the idea here is being able to differentiate between the two of them. So a final boiling point is going to be recovery of 50% or greater of the sample. And remember, final boiling point is a higher temperature, so you would expect to get more than half of the sample out. The basic concept is if a sample is heated to a point where 90% of it turns into vapor, then that temperature is going to be 90% of its final boiling point temperature. So we'll run it at that temperature, and 90% of what we put into that 100 mil flask will come out as a condensed vapor product. The temperature is fixed at that point. 10% of the total outflow in this application is out the bottom as a liquid, and 90% is out the top as a vapor. 
And again, we're constantly feeding feedstock in and take, taking the condensed vapors uh, and uh, thicker feedstock out in order to keep that feed fresh. This will take you a little bit uh, longer to wrap your head around than this one slide. So once you compare this to the ILM, hopefully you understand it a little bit. So let's see here. If water is heated to 100 degrees uh, Celsius, 90% of it would vaporize, uh, increasing the pressure. Uh, and I guess it would be a lot handier if I was looking at the diagram here, but the diagram will show up on the next page. Um, uh, so 90% of it would vaporize, increasing the pressure and opening the waste valve. 10% of the bottom liquid would leave with the vapor, uh, allowing the pot to refill because it didn't evaporate. If only 75% vaporized, the pressure wouldn't build enough and the pot temperature would rise until the pressure opened the valve. And that would indicate that we'd have a different product because it took a hotter temperature in order to make it vaporize. So if it takes more heat to make it vaporize, it means that it's heavier and it's a different product. So we can really tell the different products based on the, uh, the boiling point of the product and the pressure that's created. And we'll elaborate on that when we talk about vapor pressure next. Okay, so 50% uh, or greater, 90% uh, out the top, 10% out the bottom. That's the basic idea behind the final boiling point or endpoint analyzer. Now comparing this to the initial boiling point analyzer, all we really need to know is that the process generally is the same, and I'll talk about these pictures here in a second. Uh, as the endpoint, uh, except for that the orifice is moved to the vapor phase side uh, to control its share of the total flow out at 10%, which is the initial point. And remember, the initial point is going to be a lower temperature, so we're going to get less, we're going to get less stuff coming out of it. So the other 90% goes out the bottom. Okay, the temperature of the vapor phase, therefore, is 10% above the initial boiling point. And again, I apologize, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around all of this at once, um, but I'm trying to hit on the main points here. So initial boiling points differ from the final boil boiling point analyzers because these ones measure from 5 to 50% of the recovered boiling points. Okay, so initial boiling point, lower temperature, gets the stuff that comes off easier, the, the bottom half. Whereas the final boiling point, higher temperatures, recovers the 50% to 100% portion uh, of the sample. So if we were to look at the two diagrams here, and this is kind of important, um, one way to distinguish between the two uh, processes here is by comparing where the tops and bottoms are um, being uh, metered. So in the, in the application of these two processes from the ILM, pay attention to where the, the orifice and the temperature transmitters are. And you'll see that they're essentially uh, inverse of each other. So final boiling point analyzer here, you'll see uh, vapor comes off the top. We have pressure control. We condense it. Um, the outflow of the column is 90% of the feed because it's a final boiling point analyzer. And we have um, an orifice on the bottom here uh, controlling the flow of the liquids from the bottom. This is the stuff that didn't evaporate. Uh, remember, if we left, if we just evaporated everything off of it without feeding the new stuff in here, it would not be continuous. So we're feeding new stuff in here continuously, and this orifice is throttling that outflow of the bottom pot at 10% so that we can use most of it as condensed vapor. So this is final boiling point. Um, temperature transmitters on the pot, and the orifice is at the bottom uh, controlling the 10% uh, of the feed. If we compare that to the initial boiling point analyzer here, you'll see uh, basically the opposite is happening. We're controlling the temperature at the top of the column, and we are also uh, um, controlling the flow out through an orifice plate um, at the top. And 90%, 95% uh, of our bottoms are getting sent out as waste. So could talk probably for hours and hours on the, on this process, but it is uh, just not feasible in the amount of time we have. So uh, that's the down and dirty differences between the initial and final boiling point analyzers, uh, as the ILM states it. Last analyzer we're going to look at here in distillation is called a pack column vacuum distillation analyzer. So again, uh, talking about a uh, representation or uh, an online version of the laboratory uh, procedure. So this is uh, essentially the same again as the previous, uh, except that we have a vacuum. And again, vacuum main point here is so that we can have a higher uh, 
and we can boil higher boiling point components at a lower temperature so we can analyze them. Without the vacuum, they would be altered by the higher temperature required to vaporize them, or if you read the text, it'll say they'll decompose or they'll burn. Uh, you just can't do it based on that temperature. The main difference between the vacuum distillation uh, analyzer and the initial and the final ones that we looked on the previous slide is that this, this uh, particular system has flow controlled by gear pumps, whereas the other one was controlled by uh, pressure and orifices. And this particular model feeds reflux back into the column. Applications for distillation, boiling point analyzers commonly used in crude oil fractionation processes. Um, that's big here in Alberta. Um, we get a boiling uh, boiling range, uh, basically that is the range of temperatures from where we started, where we get our initial boiling point to the temperature uh, that is required to get the last drop out. Uh, that range is called our boiling range. Within this range are cut points. And this might have been handy to look at maybe a little bit earlier, um, but the cut points uh, are these ranges of temperatures at which different fractions can be separated. And it's, I even have kind of difficulty wrapping my head around this because these ranges are uh, kind of kind of big um, and they do kind of overlap a little bit. But again, if we stay at a set temperature somewhere within this range, we know that we can boil off all of, let's say, light, light naphtha. And then if we increase the temperature, um, a little bit so it's more in this range. So let's say here for naphtha, if we set the, uh, the temperature at 140 degrees Celsius and let it set there for a while, we know that all we would boil off, if all this was in the sample, if all this was in the sample and we set the heater to 140 and we let it sit for 10 minutes uh, and we got some vapor and the vapor condensed out into a liquid and, and it stopped condensing, we would know that if we've evaporated all the light naphtha out of that sample. We increase the temperature then, let's say, to uh, something in, in this range, so 155 degrees Celsius. Same sample, and we let that heat up. Eventually, the kerosene will vaporize and will condense into liquid, and we can measure how much of it condensed out. When it stops condensing and, and uh, dripping out, uh, we know that we've captured all of that particular component or fraction. We then increase the temperature to the next range, let's say 250 degrees Celsius. We let it sit at that temperature for a period of time. The vapors will produce, they will condense. Uh, when they stop condensing, we get our final, uh, final dropout. We then move to the next one. And by increasing these temperatures, we can identify based on this range, what type of product we should be able to find. And it starts out very general with very wide ranges, but then you can take these fractions uh, and then you can re-refine them in order to get them more and more pure uh, as you go along. And again, this is kind of a whirlwind kind of theoretical uh, explanation of distillation. Applications. Well, initial boiling point and final boiling point are very important physical properties when we're talking about fuels. Uh, the initial boiling point indicates the fuel's ability to vaporize. Uh, the lower initial boiling point means that it's more volatile or it'll, it'll uh, catch on fire easy. Um, so that tells us about the quality of our fuel. The final boiling point, if exceeded, uh, will cause engine deposits. Higher fi final boiling point means that it's thicker. Um, long story short, thinner things like gasoline are going to have uh, lower boiling points and heavier things like diesel or oil or tar or bitumen are going to have much higher boiling points. So by monitoring these initial boiling points and final boiling points, the plant can, uh, the plant, uh, can be optimized for whatever product it happens to be uh, making. This also helps maintain product specs uh, for different uh, flow streams. So at a refinery, for example, you're going to be making uh, regular gas, premium gas, diesel, kerosene, airplane fuel, all that kind of stuff. So very important in that industry. So that takes care of the first physical property, which was boiling points. The next one we're going to look at here is vapor pressure. So we'll look at the principles of analysis and applications of vapor pressure analyzers. By definition, 
Uh, and I think we've heard this before in a different lecture, but vapor pressure is the pressure of the gas molecules above the sample liquid when the sample is at equilibrium at a given temperature. Basically, all that's saying is if we heat this temperature to 90 degrees Celsius or something like that, as it heats up to that temperature, it's going to, it's going to vaporize to a certain point. And at a certain point, it's going to stop. Uh, it's going to stop vaporizing if it's a mixture. And equal amounts will be evaporating uh, as will be condensing. Two factors affect the vapor pressure. Uh, the first one is the volatility of the liquid. And the second thing is the temperature of a liquid. Uh, volatility, again, is the tendency to form a vapor. So for example, if this liquid was uh, gasoline, and I always use gasoline for vapor pressure because everybody is familiar with the uh, phenomenon of a hot jerry can and a cold jerry can. Uh, if you wake up in the morning, uh, cold morning, and you go outside to your uh, shed and you look at the gasoline for your lawnmower and the jerry can, if the lids are tight, the, the jerry can will be sucked in. Uh, and if you pull it out of the shed and you put it in the sun and go back at three o'clock in the afternoon, the jerry can is going to be all ballooned out. So two things that are happening here, we think about that jerry can. If I had two jerry cans now, one with water and one with gasoline in it, for, exa for example, and I put them both in the same environment, um, you would find that the jerry can filled with water uh, versus the jerry can that's filled with gas in the middle of the afternoon would not be nearly as large as the one filled with gas because, of course, gas is a lot more volatile than water is. So higher volatility means that it increases more pressure um, compared to uh, other liquids of less volatility. Uh, the second thing uh, that comes into play and in using the same example is the temperature uh, of the liquid. If I left the uh, water jerry can outside in the sun, it would grow. If I put the gasoline jerry can back in the shed, uh, it would shrink. So these are the two things that we have to consider when we're talking about vapor pressure. Okay, equilibrium again here is where there's an equal amount of molecules that are evaporating as or are condensing at a given temperature. And you got to remember that when we're looking at most of these physical properties, they are at a given temperature. Okay. Vapor pressure, of course, increases with temperature, jerry can example, and increases with higher volatility, uh, volatility liquids. Uh, and those are also coincidentally liquids whose molecules are not strongly attracted to each other. The temperature of the liquid provides the energy that allows the molecules to break free as vapor and then apply pressure to the sides of our vessel. The relationship between temperature and pressure is nonlinear, as you'll see on this graph here. And I could talk about this graph for a whole bunch of different minutes, but long story short, you'll see none of the lines are straight. And there's all kinds of different products uh, here as well. So interesting graph, spend some time looking at it, and you can get an idea of uh, some things that are lighter and heavier and uh, the effect of uh, this temperature on the pressure, but as a long story short here, at a set temperature, shorter chains will produce higher pressures than longer chained hydrocarbons, uh, lighter things versus heavier things. Uh, we haven't talked about hydrocarbons very much, so this might not make a bunch of sense to you, um, but just to make it real quick here, um, things like get, uh, propane, butane are gases. They have what we call short hydrocarbon chains. Then we get into the liquids, which have medium length hydrocarbon chains. So uh, think of gasoline uh, and things like that. And then as we as the hydrocarbon chains get longer, the product basically gets thicker. So the longer the chain, the thicker the product. So we move up from uh, gasoline into diesel, which is a little thicker. Then we get hydraulic oil, then uh, maybe bitumen. Uh, something like that, which is much, much thicker. And the, the commonality between them is as they get thicker or heavier, these carbon chains get longer uh, and less volatile. That's painful probably. Okay, so fun stuff here. Uh, what do we use vapor pressure for? Just like boiling point, we use it to uh, use uh, ensure product quality and make sure that we're uh, separating things what we want. Some common specifications, uh, and this is kind of cool. Uh, just because it's relatable. Specifications for propane are 208 PSI maximum at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
butane uh, at the same temperature will be 70 psi maximum. Pay attention to this number right here because this, oops, sorry, is the only time in the entire third year curriculum, all subjects that we ever use something that's not uh, metric. Okay, so as we look forward at, this, at the testing procedures, you will see that they use 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so the basic idea here is if we take a sample, we heat it up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and if we get 208 PSI out of it, we can pretty much guess that it's propane. If we heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius and it gives us 70 PSI, we can pretty much guess that it's butane. Uh, and every product will have a temperature, uh, or sorry, a pressure that it exerts in terms of vapor pressure at a given temperature. So if your specs don't match, you're not getting what you're thinking that you're getting. Uh, if you get a higher pressure, you're getting a more volatile product. If you're getting a lower pressure, you're getting a less volatile product. Okay, laboratory uh, ASTM, I missed the letter there, vapor pressure measurement. So I just like uh, distillation, we had laboratory processes and then we had online processes. These are the uh, laboratory versions that they're based off of. ASTM D32390, which is called the Reed method vapor pressure test uh, for petroleum products, except liquid petroleum gases. And hold that in the back there for a second. Uh, the second one here is an ASTM. Not so much worried about the numbers here. Uh, the names are more important here. So Reed method. Uh, the second one is dry read method for water soluble samples. We don't even talk about it beyond this point here. Uh, and the third test here, uh, ASTM 89, is for liquefied petroleum gases. So for our purposes, we're mostly limited to this uh, D90 read method and the 1267-89 for LPG. So those are the two main ones. Uh, let's look at let's look at this read vapor pressure machine here next. <clears throat> so here's an example of the reed vapor pressure uh, apparatus. Uh, this is sometimes called the air saturated method and you'll see why here as we explain it. Basically what we have here is a liquid chamber where we put our uh, sample in, a pre-measured sample, and then we have a vapor chamber and a pressure gauge on top. So pretty straightforward. Here's what you need to know about it. We first mix a known sample and air at a ratio of four to one vapor to liquid. Okay, notice liquid chamber is about a quarter the size of the vapor chamber. So we get that four to one ratio. We heat it to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, remember Fahrenheit for five minutes in a, in a bath. We remove it from the bath, we shake it vigorously, we repeat that several times, and we read the pressure on the gauge. That is the laboratory test. Kind of primitive, but it works. So four to one, air to liquid, heat it to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, shake it, read the pressure. Pretty straightforward. Online version of the air saturated vapor pressure test here. This is the exact same process as the Reed laboratory method, except it again is a continuous analyzer. It is mechanized and a pump, double ended pump down here, a pump injects the sample through an exchanger into a cell known as the saturation chamber. The saturation chamber is sitting in a bath of water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, just like the laboratory test here where it is mixed with four parts of air. The air is also um, supplied um, by, by uh, the size of the chamber. Uh, it is then drawn through the orifice where it vaporizes here and then we measure the pressure off the side of this chamber uh, through a pressure recorder and that gives us our pressure. So this is the air saturated vapor pressure method. So a few things to remember, uh, it has a pump, it's got an orifice, it's in a bath, it's four times uh, four to one ratio, again, four times air to one part sample. So very, very, very similar here, but again, continuous. Okay, the, another version uh, is called the dynamic vapor pressure method here. This one does not introduce air into the sample. Uh, this uses a jet pump or an inductor pump in order to vaporize the fluid. And this can perform all three types of the RVP uh, ASTM tests that we looked at earlier. So uh, the wet, dry read, 
the dry dry read or sorry the dry read vapor pressure the wet read vapor pressure and the lpg test so that's what i mean by this bullet point here so again here pressurized sample comes in through exchanger where it is heated uh, goes through an orifice where it is vaporized the vapor uh, temperature uh, is measured here as well and you have the pressure uh, indicator coming off the side recording the vapor pressure of our sample okay applications for vapor pressure first one is refinery product and feedstock quality uh, this one relates uh, tightly to fuel or at least the example in the ilm talks about the volatility of a fuel being very important uh, it affects cold starting ability and the point of vapor lock um, very important of course if you're not on the ground not quite as bad in our car but of course we'd be very upset uh, if we bought gasoline and it didn't ignite when we turned the key second major application here is safety uh, we don't want the vapor pressure to exceed the ratings of pressure vessels and tanks that of course would be uh, very bad um, we also don't want cavitation and pumps caused by liquids flashing into a vapor um, as this would damage the pump so knowing the vapor pressure of our fluids uh, allows us to operate the process safely. Last application here is environmental. Um, and we'll introduce a couple of new terms here. The first one are VOCs or volatile organic compounds. These have uh, become increasingly popular, of course, in an environmentally conscious world. Uh, they are created when released hydro hydrocarbons evaporate. And they react with sunlight to create smog, as we see here. So the mandate uh, nowadays is, of course, to reduce VOCs. And if you've renovated your house lately, uh, you'll see that there's all kinds of paint products now that advertise low VOCs uh, with the goal to reduce these environmental emissions. Uh, governments also regulate uh, the rebate for pressure of gasoline in order to reduce the amount of these VOCs as well. That is the end of objective two uh, on vapor pressure. Uh, moving to the third physical property now, viscosity. Uh, looking at the principles of analysis and application of viscosity analyzers. So let's define viscosity here real quickly. Uh, fluid flow characteristic relating to the force required for one layer of a liquid to slide off another layer. Uh, that's the complicated definition of it and hard to visualize uh, more commonly we we uh, define viscosity as the resistance to flow or generally understand it as how thick a fluid is uh, physically uh, we generally understand that higher temperatures generally generally will result in a lower viscosity in a given fluid so for example your vehicle uh, oil in the summertime is uh, generally going to be thicker uh sorry thinner than it is in the winter time uh, and that's why your vehicles can be a little bit harder to start okay so um lower temperature higher viscosity higher temperature lower viscosity as a general rule okay viscosity analysis uh, why do we even bother well there's obviously a number of different reasons for it um it affects the design of process flow equipment such as pumps, pipes, and meters. We talk about uh, pressure drop and, and things like that. Um, so we need to know a little bit of background information before we get into um, how and why we measure for viscosity. We have to talk a little bit about what affects viscosity and what are the units and things that we need to be aware of. So first of all, we'll talk about uh, the first comment I made here, talking about these one layers of a liquid sliding off another, and it's not intuitive, um, but it's really what is actually happening here. So let's talk about that fluid behavior. Uh, this is a Newtonian concept, so there's your big word for the day, uh, which deals with how a liquid's viscosity of, is affected when force is applied to it. When fluid flows in a pipe, we are really uh, having these different layers that make up our flow our, our flow profile uh, and this is where we get the word laminar from uh, laminar just like laminate or uh, plywood for example being laminated layers we're talking about layers of fluid closer to the wall there's more friction because it's rubbing up against the wall and the wall is stickier or has more friction and in the center there's less friction and that's why we get this flow pro 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 blah, 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 blah. 
flow profile that we've mentioned many different times before. Uh, so when the fluid flows in a pipe, the layers move more slowly at the walls and faster in the middle. There's friction between the layers that creates a change and this velocity uh, flow profile. So that's just some good general background uh, knowledge here. So this Newtonian concept uh, deals with how a liquid's viscosity is affected when force is applied to it. And this is a um, good example when I'm in the lab. I, I do a little demonstration here that kind of helps us sink in a little bit. Um, but this Newtonian concept, again, uh, deals with how a liquid, uh, the viscosity acts when force is applied to it. So Newtonian liquids, uh, and this is important for you to remember, probably one of the bigger things to remember about this little section here. Newtonian liquids do not change their viscosity when force is applied to them. And that's probably the way you're thinking uh, in your head. You're thinking, well, I, I can't think of any fluid that does change its viscosity when force is applied uh, to it, but there are some. Uh, Non-Newtonians is what we call them, uh, and they will have a change in viscosity when force is applied. So examples uh, of Newtonian liquids, water, air, some oils, right? You can, you can put your hand under the tap uh, to wash your hands and you rub your hands together, uh, you push harder and the water has nothing, it doesn't play into it at all. Um, if you had a non-Newtonian non liquid, for example, um, things like ketchup is a good example, right? You pour your ketchup bottle upside down, uh, and the ketchup doesn't pour out of it, but then you apply some force to it and then it starts to flow. So that's kind of uh, the, the idea between Newtonian and non-Newtonian. Uh, this oobleck, if you've ever seen it before, uh, this is a Dr. Seuss word, but basically if you take water and cornstarch and you mix it together into a fluid, and maybe I'd encourage you to look this up on maybe YouTube or something for an example, I would do this in the classroom normally, um, but you mix up a mixture of cornstarch and water, and you drop a spoon into it, and the spoon will slowly sink to the bottom of, of your cup. Um, if you take that same spoon and you try to stab it into the cup, it will actually, the oobleck will actually turn hard. So that's the difference between a Newtonian liquid and a non-Newtonian liquid. And there's not a whole bunch of non-Newtonian liquids out there, but that is something about fluid behavior that you need to kind of understand. Okay, this affects things like shear stress. Uh, we'll look at a couple of terms here. Uh, shear stress uh, is the force that's applied parallel to a liquid. It is a, a number that is related to the force per unit area. The amount of force divided by the contact area. So there's a few things in here uh, in the ILM that you kind of have to uh, wrap your head around. I think the math has been removed. Let me just have a quick look here because we used to have to do some math around this. Um, and it looks like the math has been removed from here already. I'm not 100% sure it has been from my exams yet, but um, I'll look at that after this presentation. Okay, so shear stress is simply force over area measured in newtons per square meter, and it is a measure of how much force it takes to move the layers. What does this mean to us? It means that higher viscosities are going to require more force to achieve the same velocity. So imagine washing your hands in water or washing your hands with molasses, and I think I got myself a step ahead of myself here. Okay, uh, Newton's calculations are based on uh, absolute or dynamic viscosity. We'll talk more about these terms in a second. We're talking uh, about viscosity units in this slide here. So there's two types of viscosity we're going to talk about. Um, the first one is called absolute and the second other one is called kinematic. Uh, first we're going to talk about this absolute which has a alias also known as dynamic viscosity which measured uh, as a resistance to flow when force is applied to a fluid. We'll talk about that in a We'll elaborate on that in the next slide. An easy example of this is uh, washing your hands. So here's the example. Washing your hands when you um, put them under water is pretty easy, but if you were to do the same with molasses, you'll know that it's much harder uh, and uh, slower moving your back, with back your hands back and forth. And this is due to the much higher viscosity. So when we measure viscosity, we have a couple of units. Uh, absolute viscosity is proportional to the force and velocity ratio represented by the symbol silly n or eta in calculations. Um, the SI units are pascals, other units are poison, centipoise, and I think these are the ones that are most commonly used uh, here in Canada. The relationship, uh, one pascal second is equal to 10 poise, 
and one millipascal second is equal to one centipoise. Common fluids are usually between 0.5 centipoise and 1,000 centipoise, so we typically use that unit. So this is for dynamic, okay? So um, we'll elaborate on this in a minute. So dynamic or absolute viscosity units are the poise or the centipoise. Three slides just to get to that. Second unit or measurement style for a viscosity is called kinematic, okay? Um, kinematic is a different measurement. It's a different unit, but they are related. Uh, the relationship between absolute and kinematic viscosity is similar to that relationship between volumetric flow and mass flow, but not quite the same. Uh, when they are both measured, it is shown that the kinematic viscosity is a ratio of the dynamic viscosity and the fluid's density. So you see there's a little bit of similarities between kinematic viscosity and dynamic viscosity. Uh, what we need to know about this is we need to know that A, there is uh, dynamic slash absolute viscosity and also kinematic viscosity, and we have to know the units that are attached to them. That's what this little section is about. Uh, we'll elaborate on both of them a little bit more moving forward. So again, if we know the absolute viscosity and we know the density, we can then calculate uh, the kinematic, so, or vice versa if we have two or three of these anyway. Um, the units that we use for kinematic viscosity uh, are the stoke and the centistoke. So one stoke is equal to one times 10 to the negative four meters per second squared. Uh, one cent of soak is 10 to the negative six. So this is, I know, a lot of information for you to try to absorb. Um, but once you read through the ILM, hopefully this gets a little clearer for you. Okay, kinematic viscosity, again, is the ratio of dynamic viscosity to the density of the fluid. And it is measured with special capillary tubes and relates to the time it takes to flow out. Okay, so the kinematic viscosity is the time measured times the tube constant. Uh, I used to have an image of an actual uh, kinematic uh, viscometer here, or uh, Ostwald, I believe is what the name of this is here. But long story short, uh, you put a volume uh, of fluid in here, you start timing it, and when it runs out, you stop timing it somewhere in this. Uh, capillary, there's a little orifice that controls the amount of flow, and you measure that time, and it, it is uh, related to the kinematic viscosity. Okay, one more distinction between the names, the units. Uh, here's the physical distinction between these two uh, types of measurements of viscosity. So we're comparing absolute slash dynamic and kinematic viscosity. So two different types. Okay, let's make sure we're distinct about that. Absolute is one type, kinematic is another. Absolute viscosity is a measured resistance to a movement that a body has in contact with a fluid, meaning that there is force involved here somewhere. Okay, stirring, mixing, rubbing, pushing, whatever it is, there's some movement involved when we're measuring that fluid. Distinctly different than kinematic viscosity, which is a measurement of the flow of a fluid. So this is, there's nothing dynamic about this. You pour it into a container and you time it. There's no force applied. And that's a huge difference that you need to remember between these two types of viscosity measurements. So absolute or dynamic has force. Kinematic does not. Okay, uh, something that's a little less painful maybe here. Uh, from experience, we know that as a liquid gets warmer, it flows more easily most of the time. This is due to the fact that as a fluid heats up, the molecules get more energy and are able to break apart, therefore making it easier for objects to move through them or for objects to move around them. The opposite of this is true for gases probably you're going to see a question on this statement in the test in your future. Okay, so that was a lot of somewhat sketchy, really abbreviated theory uh, on viscosity. Now we're going to get into something that is a little bit 
more relatable to us. Uh, looking at the laboratory style uh, viscometers or the analysis that's used in the laboratory. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Just going to hit on some basics here. Um, we have three basic tests. I'm not too worried about the numbers. I don't expect you to remember these. Uh, I do expect you to kind of have an idea of the names and what type of uh, measurement you're doing with the particular device. So we have three that we're going to discuss. The first one is a capillary, so that's the one we looked at in the previous slide. Uh, second one is called an efflux cup, similar a lot to the capillary one, and these are both kinematic measurement devices. And again, measurement unit is Stokes or Semi Stokes. The last one is a rotational style viscometer. This is used for dynamic viscosity measurements. So again, these ones work just on gravity. There's no force involved. These ones that measure dynamic have some kind of movement or force applied. So let's look. Okay, capillary tube, uh, as we saw in the previous diagram here, uh, it's also called, or hopefully you'll remember this as the Ostwald viscometer. Uh, the way it works is we preheat a sample, we draw it up to a start, a start mark here, and then we release it and then we time it. The time it takes to get from the stop start mark to the stop mark uh, determines the time for the sample to efflux, which is a fancy word for flow, through in this capillary. You see the capillary is restricted. This will change for different viscosity scales. We then get a time. We multiply it by a calibration constant that's related to the specific capillary device, and it will give us a measurement in centistokes. So you'll see this is just gravity and time. The second one here is called the efflux cup, uh, also called the Sabolt viscometer. Uh, basically works on the same efflux or flowing principle. We fill this up. There's an orifice. Um, this has a set volume and we time the amount of time it takes for that fluid to flow through this. This is also a measurement of kinematic viscosity. So the previous one, as well as this one, no force applied, kinematic viscosity. Last one here is uh, the rotational viscometer. Uh, we'll see where will we see? We'll see other ones of these in a different subject. Um, measurement, we talk about this a little bit too. Uh, so a rotational viscometer. The biggest thing to notice first here is look at this. It's got a motor. It's talking about rotation, which is a movement. So there's force involved. So when there's movement or force involved, we know we're measuring dynamic viscosity. The principle of operation of this device uh, is that it measures the torque required to spin this object in our sample and the amount of force required is proportional to the viscosity of that fluid. So uh, if I was to say put this fluid here as water and I went up there and I could spin this probably with my fingers pretty good uh, and this drum would spin relatively easily. If I filled this up with uh, honey, let's say, uh, and I tried to spin it, it is not going to freely spin at all. I'm going to have to constantly apply force to it. So that force will be proportional um, to the viscosity. So we look at four different types of online viscosity analyzers. So now we're crossing the line from the theoretical laboratory methods into the viscosity analyzers. We will look at four types, the capillary, oscillating and vibrating, rotary motion, and moving piston and you'll see that one of these looks like it's for kinematic and the rest of them look like they're for dynamic. In order to measure viscosity there must be motion between the sample and the sensor and of course some of them require force. Here is a capillary viscometer and there, lo and behold is our, is our capillary. You'll see we have a differential pressure transmitter in here a couple of heat, ex, uh, heat exchangers in here in order to maintain uh, a constant temperature for representative sampling. So what happens here? Uh, fluid flows through a capillary. The differential pressure develops across the tube. If the flow rate were remaining constant, the differential pressure sensed here would change with the viscosity. The dynamic viscosity, therefore, is a, uh, a result of the constant of the tube 
and the differential pressure differ, uh, created by that tube. <clears throat> second style, uh, second and third style, I guess, are the oscillating and vibrating viscometers. So again, very primitive drawing here. Uh, we have a drive oscillator uh, similar to a Coriolis meter that would cause some uh, vibratory movement in here or oscillations in here. Uh, the probe in one way or another anyway is made to move. The surrounding fluid, of course, will have drag on this movement and the reduction in amplitude will relate to the viscosity. So when a, a liquid, this thing would move quite quickly. And then if, as viscosity increased, this would slow down uh, not only in frequency, but also probably in amplitude. Two types of oscillating or vibrating viscometers that are mentioned in the ILM include the torsional oscillation style, where the coil provides torque on a tube and the liquid pro uh, provides resistance, and the torque current required is proportional to the velocity. Uh, the second style is a vibrating probe, where we have a drive coil and a sensing coil used to sense the amount of amplitude dampening the sample. Um, it's very similar to a Coriolis meter. Last here, we have a vibrating viscometer. This one here has, a, as you see, a, a little coil here. Again, very similar to Coriolis meter here, where this vibrating probe is made to vibrate, and the surrounding fluid will have drag on this movement, and a reduction in the amplitude or an increase in the amplitude will relate to the viscosity. We have a drive coil, a sensing coil, used to sense the amount of amplitude dampening that the sensor uh, creates. <clears throat> so lots of these ones, very similar uh, in operation. Last one, oh, excuse me, rotary motion viscometer, uh, very similar to the laboratory version that we looked at earlier. Uh, cylinder or paddle or something rotates at a constant speed and the drag uh, generated by the fluid creates a torque or a requirement for torque that is proportional to the viscosity. Uh, the increase or decrease of current required to keep a constant speed of this drive motor is proportional uh, to our viscosity and is the output of this particular transmitter. Uh, mentioned in the ILM specifically for this one here, uh, if it's in turbulent and or bubbly environments, we will install a baffle tube uh, in order to minimize the effects of turbulence or, or bubbly environments. Uh, and as a general rule, if it's bubbly or turbulent, it's gonna show as uh, a, false, uh, a false thinness. It's gonna make it, if there's bubble or turbulence, it's gonna make it easier for uh, things to turn or move in it. So it'll cause a false reading. All right, moving on, moving piston viscometer. Uh, illustrated here, kind of a sensor. We have fluid flow coming in, this piston moving uh, back and forth. And again, the, the physics behind this is pretty easy to wrap our brains around, I hope. Uh, the speed of a moving piston is measured by coils, sensing the time it takes to travel uh, in between them. This is kind of like that uh, ball prover that we looked at in uh, flow measurement a long time ago, it seems like anyway. Uh, this. This will have temperature compensation. Most of them probably do have temperature compensation because most of these measurements are at the specified temperature. But again, uh, you get the idea here. You have the coils moving back and forth. Uh, if the viscosity is low, this will go relatively quickly. And if the viscosity is high, it will move relatively slowly. Where do we use these viscosity analyzers, you may ask? Uh, largely used in many different industries, but mentioned in the ILM, uh, we have oil refining where it's used to uh, monitor product quality. It's used in the fruit, uh, particularly common in the food industry, industry to measure the viscosity of syrups, sauces, milk, things like that. A great example is our uh, ketchup, right? Uh, what differentiates a good ketchup from a bad ketchup? Uh, most of us tend to think it's the the flow, right? You get a Heinz ketchup is nice and thick. Um, the generic ketchup is very thin. So uh, it's an important quality in the food industry. Uh, chemical processing, uh, when you're making polymers, uh, dilution, blending, that type of thing, viscosity is um, very handy. 
K-capillary tube style is very common in the petroleum industry, uh, and you can use mechanical ones in just about any of the industries that we talked about on the previous slide. Installation requirements for viscosity, uh, again, subject to errors due to bubbles, high flow rates, and excessive turbulence. Uh, we talked about using what was essentially a stilling well. What was the term that we used for that in the previous one here? Uh, the, the, the baffle tube. Um, we can also use another common uh, installation process here, the, this bypass kind of loop here for reduced flow rates here. Uh, we want laminar flow, right? Not turbulent, not bubbles. So we want laminar flow. And again, by doing one of these fast bypass loops, we can uh, we can get rid of some of those problems. Objective four, density. Last physical property we're going to talk about again today. How many of you out there can name them all up to now? Boiling point, vapor pressure, viscosity, and now density. Okay, so same thing uh, with this physical property as any others in terms of objectives. Let's talk about density, and we've already talked about density num numerous times, so hopefully this is review. All matter, be it solid, liquid, or gas, has density. Density is the mass per unit of volume of a substance. Density is some mass in some amount of a space. If we increase the mass but not the space, density goes up. If we decrease the space but not the mass, density goes up. If we increase the space but not the mass, density goes down. So uh, relatively simple in terms of physics. The units, of course, are going to be some type of a mass unit over some type of a volume unit. So grams per centimeter, kilograms per meter, pounds per foot, et cetera, et cetera. Density is also commonly related to specific gravity. Uh, it's kind of the liquid version of density, you could say, without locking me into that. Um, specific gravity, uh, by definition, is the ratio of a liquid's density to that of water at four degrees Celsius. Uh, at four degrees Celsius, um, most of us understand water to be one gram per cubic centimeter or a cube of water to be a metric ton. Specific gra gravity uh, in terms of gas is related to that of air at standard conditions. Uh, these conditions are 15 degrees Celsius and 101.325 kPa's. Um, these are just some common things that we need to know for backup. Uh, there are some industry-specific standards out there, which I, I think is a little bit dirty to put in the ILM. Um, but for example, the American Petroleum Institute uh, has their own standard, which is inversely proportional to specific gravity. Uh, and it uses this wonderful uh, formula here. And I think this is in red for some terrible, terrible reason, wink, wink. Okay, uh, another industry-specific standard here, uh, one is called the BOM, B-A-U-M-E. Uh, this is specifically used in food and chemical industries. Uh, it uses two scales, a light scale where the gravity is less than one and a heavy scale where the gravity is greater than one. And you can see the different formulas that they uh, use here. I don't think I'm too concerned about this, but um, just know that there are other standards out there, the API standard and the BOM standard, for example. If I said, where do you use the API standard? Uh, know that it's for the petroleum industry. Where, and if I ask you, where is the BOM standard used? Know that it's in food and, and chemicals. Okay, laboratory density measurement. Density and specific gravity measurements rely on weight or buoyancy measurements, typically. Uh, two devices uh, used for this. The first one is called a pink Pycnometer or pycnometer. I'm not sure how to pronounce that exactly. Uh, it's a stoppered vessel, this guy up here, that is weighed, then filled, and then brought to temperature. Uh, the volume will then be adjusted to a specification. You see there's a volume calibration mark on here, and then it is reweighed. So we put this in, uh, we fill this up with whatever, let it get to temperature so that if it wants to expand, it can. Uh, if it's over that level, we empty some out. If it's below, we put it in and get it at that temperature, and then we weigh it. And then it's and that's it's as straightforward as that. Uh, the second one, most of us have probably seen before, uh, is called a hydrometer. 
Uh, simply, it's a weighted glass bulb with a scale on it, some lead weights on the bottom, and you drop it in to our sample, and we measure on the scale the specific gravity. Uh, this one can have temperature compensation. Uh, this one, you'll have to have the thermometer as well. Okay, so looking at the density analyzers now on page 37, we will uh, look quickly uh, first at liquid density analyzers, then we'll look at gas density analyzers. So the first one is a buoyancy uh, density analyzer. As you see here, this is a, kind of a bridal type of situation here. Uh, we have a float uh, that has some type of um, magnets or something on it or coils on it that will change the electrical signals uh, of these ones represented uh, here by these transformers. Uh, float with an iron core, so we know if we move an iron core through a magnetic field, we'll get some uh, current output, so that's how that's measured. Uh, you got a compensator here for temperature, and we'll just quickly, what does it say here? Higher density fluid. Uh, the higher density fluid, the more buoyant, the less dense it is, the less buoyant. Um, the buoyant float will move inside the field between the coil and the secondary output is related to the amount of the float in the field. So uh, in a lighter product, product, this would sink. In a heavier product, it would stay up, is a short story on the buoyancy density analyzer. Second one here is a radiation absorption style density analyzer and i don't remember if we talked about this in measurement or not but we probably will later uh, gamma rays which is our favorite type of radiation for uh, instrumentation is emitted from a source holder transmitted through the sample to an ionization detector over here if you remember from nuclear which senses the reduction in radiation due to the absorption that is due to the density of the sample. This reduction in intensity is proportional to the sample density. So the denser the material in our process, the more of it gets absorbed, uh, the more radiation gets absorbed in it, and the less is detected from the uh, detector. Okay, this next one here, uh, we're dealing now with gas and liquid density analyzers here. So these ones have uh, the opportunity to do both. Okay, due to the high maintenance requirements of mechanical density analyzers, whew, excuse me, uh, recent trends are to use two types of analyzers for both gas and liquids. And these are the vibrating sensor style or our new favorite device, the oscillating Coriolis style. They both basically operate on the same principle, the IOM. Uh, discusses them over the course of two or three pages. I am going to summarize them all here in one page. They measure the density based on the change in the vibrating frequency of the sensor on a fluid. They come in a couple of different configurations, so a spool style, as we see here, a YouTube style, as we see over here, think Coriolis meter, and a fork style, as you see here. All of them work basically the, the same kind of uh, same kind of way. As the mass increases or the density increases, it's going to cause a reduction in uh, the frequency of our waves of oscillation. The way I like to remember this in my head uh, to deal with all of these types of devices is man, imagine yourself standing in a swimming pool up to your waist. And then you wave your arms uh, back and forth, side to side in the air, and it's pretty easy. And then you scrunch down so that you're uh, in the water up to your neck, and then you do the same arm wave. Uh, you can't do it nearly as fast as you would have been able to do it in air. And then imagine being in the same position and having the swimming pool filled up with honey or molasses. You would be even slower swinging your arms back and forth. So that's the easiest way, I think, to remember the, the uh, operating procedure or the, the way that these things work. Uh, aside from their, you know, their uh, configuration and mechanical differences, they all work on the same basic principle. Okay, the oscillated Coriolis meter here, or the U-shaped one here, is, uh, can be used for measuring flow and density. We learned that in a different subject. Uh, they're good with liquids, slurries, and gases. We all 
also learned that they're not super awesome for low density gases, but we can use them for gases. Um, you want to know more about it? I'm referring you back to the measurement uh, ILM to learn more about Coriolis meters, but you should know enough by now uh, to recall that. Applications uh, for viscosity, or sorry, density, get my physical properties mixed up here. Uh, these are used to know, uh, used where we need to know the fluid density values, uh, concentrations of materials, and or identifying or classifying petroleum products. Density is represented by the Greek letter uh, P. This is the closest I could find, uh, closest symbol I could find to it, uh, which is rho. It's the same one that we used in our uh, PGH calculations for uh, differential pressure level. Uh, and it is used extensively in measurement, uh, pressure and level in tanks, used in manometers, flow through valves and orifices, used in calculating Reynolds numbers, uh, density is used in calculating mass flow. Uh, used in automotives to test antifreeze and batteries, uh, all kinds of different applications for uh, measuring density. That is the end of what is probably not one of the funner ILMs that we've done so far. So hopefully the things that we've discussed today uh, will be refined a little bit as you read through the long versions in the ILM. Uh, it's kind of a lot to take in, um, but just know that the physical properties are pretty important in industry and, and pretty important for us to understand the basics. Have a good day.